we left off discussing how nucleotides, which are monomers, are joined together by dehydration synthesis to ultimately form a polymer, which is called a polynucleotide. Many nucleotides join together by strong covalent bonds. The new covalent bonds are called phosphodiester bonds, and they form when the hydroxyl group of one nucleotide, specifically at the third carbon of the sugar, deoxyribose or ribose, interacts with the phosphate group on another nucleotide. Specifically, the phosphate is attached to the fifth carbon on the sugar, again ribose or deoxyribose. We'll attempt to illustrate that on the next slide. We'll begin our drawing with a phosphate group of one nucleotide, which consists of a phosphorus atom joined to four oxygen atoms. That phosphate group is linked to a carbon atom, the fifth carbon atom, actually, of our sugar, which is attached to another carbon atom. And there is our pentose sugar with one, two, three, four, and five carbon atoms. If this is a DNA nucleotide, the sugar here is deoxyribose, and therefore it would have just a hydrogen attached to the second carbon, and a hydroxyl group always is on the third. And then the first carbon of the deoxyribose is attached to a base. And let's just pick one. Let's say, for example, the base in question is adenine. Now we need to draw another nucleotide below. So again, we'll have our phosphate group. And that's attached to the fifth carbon of our sugar. So one, two, three, four, five carbons. on deoxyribose, and there's a hydroxyl on the third carbon and a hydrogen on the second. And then we need another base for our nucleotide. Perhaps this time we have guanine, for example. With two nucleotides in position, we can now perform a dehydration synthesis reaction. And that is going to occur between the phosphate group of one nucleotide and the hydroxyl group of the other. When these atoms are removed, we will actually lose a molecule of water, and in that place is going to be a new covalent bond, a phosphodiester bond. And this is going to happen over and over again to build the sugar phosphate backbone of our polynucleotide. Sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, etc. The next nucleotide to join this growing chain would enter from the bottom of my drawing, and once again, we would have a dehydration synthesis reaction to create another covalent bond. And new nucleotides are always being added to the three prime hydroxyl of an existing chain. Therefore, we say that new nucleotides are synthesized in the five prime to the three prime direction because we're always adding new nucleotides to that three prime hydroxyl end, as you can see here. This ultimately creates a backbone of sugar phosphate units, but it's the bases along the DNA or RNA, our polynucleotide, that are important in storing information and that are unique for each gene. So we're talking about the adenines, the guanines, the thymines, and the cytosines if we're talking about DNA bases. RNA bases are the same except for we have uracil in place of thymine if we're talking about RNA base sequences. The structure of DNA specifically is of two polynucleotide chains that are joined together. The two polynucleotides are linked in the center of the molecule by hydrogen bonds between bases. So let's start there. If we have two strands of DNA 
uh, my lines would represent the sugar phosphate backbone that we just discussed. The bases are in the center of the molecule. And if there's an adenine on one DNA strand, then across the way it will always be attached to a thymine on the other strand. And adenine and thymine are always joined together by two hydrogen bonds. When there is a guanine in one part of the DNA molecule, it will always be attached to a cytosine base on the other strand, and this time with three hydrogen bonds. So these base pairing rules are consistent in a DNA double helix. Double because it has two strands of nucleotides, and helix because it coils around on itself in a right-handed twist or a right-handed helix. If you know the sequence of one DNA strand, you automatically know the sequence of its complementary DNA strand because of these base pairing rules we just discussed. Adenine is always connected to thymine by two hydrogen bonds, and guanine is always connected to cytosine by three hydrogen bonds. Another thing to consider about DNA structure is the fact that it's anti-parallel. This means if one strand is running in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, its complementary strand that it's attached to by hydrogen bonds is running in the opposite direction, 3' prime to 5'. Prime. These numbers represent the orientation of the nucleotides. So the molecule is geometrically consistent, but it runs in opposite directions so that the bases can pair up as they do the molecule must be anti-parallel for this base pairing to occur. To get a better picture of what these 5' prime and 3' prime numbers refer to, let's take a look at the following slide. Here is a small molecule of DNA. The strand on the left has a nucleotide that I'm highlighting in red, where you can see the phosphate, deoxyribose sugar, and the base thymine. There's one nucleotide. It is joined to another nucleotide and another. And we discussed how this happens. New nucleotides are joined together by dehydration synthesis to create this sugar phosphate backbone. Sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. It's a strong sugar phosphate backbone. On the other side, you see another strand of nucleotides but let's take a look at how these nucleotides are oriented. If you look at the deoxyribose sugar in particular and find the oxygen atom on it, notice that the oxygen atom is on the bottom of the molecule in this illustration, but the complementary strand has the oxygen atom on the top. So you can see by looking at the deoxyribose sugar that they are flipped in opposite directions. Therefore, the entire nucleotide is flipped in the opposite direction and that allows for the complementary base pairing to occur in the center of the molecule, the hydrogen bonds between A's, T's, G's, and C's. We label the ends of the DNA molecule with a three prime or a five prime in reference to the carbon atom on deoxyribose that is closest to that end of the molecule. This particular illustration is showing you a DNA molecule that runs 5' prime to 3' prime on the left and 3' prime to 5' prime on the right. And those numbers refer specifically to carbon atoms on the sugar. Also notice in this picture that we have three hydrogen bonds between every guanine and cytosine and two hydrogen bonds between every adenine and thymine. And you can see the base pairing rules. When one strand has a thymine, the complementary strand always has an adenine. When one strand has a guanine, the complementary always has a cytosine. So if you know the sequence of one DNA strand, you automatically know the sequence of its complementary strand because of these base pairing rules that we were learning about. And it's the bases that store information. How many base pairs are shown in this illustration? If you said four, you were correct. There are four base pairs.
A typical DNA molecule in one of your chromosomes is going to have millions of base pairs. Your smallest human chromosomes have about 50 million base pairs, whereas the largest have about 250 million base pairs. So you can see this is a very tiny illustration, a very tiny molecule of DNA is shown. A more simplified diagram of DNA is shown here. You can see it's double-stranded. It's coiled in a helix. The two strands are held together by hydrogen bonding between complementary bases, although the numbers of hydrogen bonds are not clearly represented in this illustration. Remember, guanine is always connected to cytosine by three hydrogen bonds, whereas adenine is always connected to thymine by two hydrogen bonds where one strand is running 5 prime to 3 prime, the other one is running 3 prime to 5 prime. And that allows for the complementary base pairing that occurs in the middle of the molecule. If DNA is going to be replicated in preparation for cell division, for example, the two strands of DNA are first separated from one another. Hydrogen bonds are broken. That exposes the bases in the center of the molecule. You can see that if the parent strand of DNA has a guanine, then the enzyme that's synthesizing a new DNA strand is going to grab a complementary nucleotide that matches up with the DNA template in the original strand. So when DNA is replicated, one molecule of DNA gets converted into two identical new molecules of DNA. But each new molecule of DNA is half old strand and half brand new strand. And the new strands here are shown in orange. DNA synthesis happens in a semi-conservative fashion where every DNA molecule is half old or half conserved and half newly formed by dehydration synthesis. The final slides are a nice summary of the key points to take home in this chapter. Also, you have a nice table at the end of your organic molecules laboratory that does the same thing with a little more detail. We talked about carbohydrates first. Carbohydrates have monomers that we refer to as monosaccharides. And recall that most monosaccharides have a carbon to hydrogen to oxygen ratio of one to two to one. And we see that in our examples of monosaccharides that we looked at, glucose and fructose, which have molecular formulas of C6H12O6. You also learned that when we take two monosaccharides and join them together, we build a disaccharide, such as lactose or sucrose. And if several hundred or thousand dehydration synthesis reactions occur, we finally build a polysaccharide, and you learn that cellulose is a structural polysaccharide, whereas starch stores energy for a plant, glycogen stores energy for animals, and chitin is structural and has a protective role for fungal cell walls and the exoskeletons of some organisms. Lipids are a very diverse class of biological molecule they have, take on many different forms, but you should remember that regardless of the type of lipid, they are always at least partially, if not fully, hydrophobic or nonpolar, and therefore do not dissolve in water. Fats, or triglycerides, were the first type of lipid we studied. And recall that every triglyceride, or triacylglycerol, every fat molecule, consists of one glycerol unit linked to three fatty acids. If those fatty acids have all single bonds between carbon atoms, then they are saturated with hydrogens. They have the maximum number of hydrogens. And saturated fats are solid at room temperature. But if we introduce some double bonds in those fatty acid hydrocarbon tails, then we get unsaturated fats with fewer than the maximum hydrogens, and we see things like olive oil that are liquid at room temperature. Phospholipids are the most important lipid for you to know in this class. Phospholipids are similar to triglycerides in that they contain 
one glycerol unit, two fatty acids instead of three, and then the different group is the phosphate group, which is always negatively charged. So our illustration on the left shows you where that charged phosphate group would be at the head of the molecule, attached to a glycerol unit, and then our two fatty acid tails. Since this molecule has a charged head, it does have a region that is hydrophilic. But the fatty acids, which are nonpolar, are hydrophobic. So we call this type of molecule that's part hydrophilic and part hydrophobic amphiphilic. And that's really important when we look at membrane structure. Because of the amphiphilic nature of phospholipids, they tend to form a phospholipid bilayer in the aqueous environment of a cell, where the charged phosphate heads interact with water inside and outside the cell, whereas the hydrophobic nonpolar fatty acids are in the center of the membrane. Steroids are also important for membranes, in particular cholesterol for mammalian cell membranes. Cholesterol has a very different structure. It's a steroid. However, it is hydrophobic, so it's in this category of lipid. It's important for membranes because it maintains the fluidity and the integrity of the cell membrane. Fungi have a different type of steroid in their cell membranes that has the same function. Also, steroids are important for some hormones. There are vertebrate sex hormones that are actually derived from cholesterol precursors. Proteins, as we discussed previously, have many, many different structures and therefore many, many different functions for an organism. And recall that organisms are mostly protein as we look at all these different types of biological molecules. The monomer for all proteins is the amino acid. And recall that every amino acid has a central carbon attached to a hydrogen and then three chemical groups. All amino acids have an amino group and a carboxyl group. The way in which the different types of amino acid vary from one another is in their third chemical group, which we call the R group. And there are 20 different types of R groups, therefore 20 different amino acids. The linear sequence in which amino acids are joined together during dehydration synthesis will ultimately determine the three-dimensional form of a polypeptide and then a protein, and thus its function for the cell. The final class of biological molecule we looked at was that of nucleic acids, which are important for storing and transmitting hereditary information. And the key word here is information. These form the, the recipe for all the proteins in the body, or the blueprint for what the cell is and what the organism looks like and can do. The monomers for nucleic acids are called nucleotides. And every nucleotide has a phosphate group, a 5-carbon sugar, or pentose sugar, and a nitrogenous base, or a nitrogen-containing base. Recall that both DNA and RNA are nucleic acids built from nucleotides, but the nucleotides vary a little bit. For example, DNA nucleotides have deoxyribose, that's their pentose sugar, whereas RNA nucleotides have the sugar ribose, the base that's attached is going to be either cytosine, guanine, adenine, or thymine if it's a DNA nucleotide. And for RNA, we can have three of the same possibilities, but the difference being instead of thymine, RNA will have uracil. So that's a difference there in base. And then another difference between DNA and RNA is that DNA is typically a double-stranded molecule. So two strands of nucleotides linked in the center by hydrogen bonds, whereas RNA is typically a single strand of nucleotides joined together. Here we are looking at the dehydration synthesis reaction that is used to build a polypeptide chain. Recall that the covalent bonds that form are specifically referred to as peptide bonds. If 
they are linking amino acids. Here we are looking at a very simplified model of DNA, a very small DNA molecule. Notice that the two strands of DNA are anti-parallel. In other words, one strand runs 5 prime to 3 prime, whereas its complementary strand runs 3 prime to 5 prime. So we say that the two strands are anti-parallel for that reason. We also say that the two strands of a DNA molecule are complementary. And this refers to the base pairing rules. If one strand has a thymine, it will be connected to an adenine on the other strand by two hydrogen bonds. Whereas if one strand has a cytosine, we know that it's always going to be connected to a guanine on the other strand. So the complementary nature of DNA describes these base pairing rules. And how many base pairs are shown in this illustration? There are seven base pairs shown, or seven BPs, if you will. A very small piece of DNA when we consider that one of our DNA molecules will have at least 50 million of these in the smallest of our chromosomes. We typically describe DNA size by base pairs. As we look at our different classes of biological molecules, we've learned that we always take some sort of monomer and join them together by dehydration synthesis to build a polymer or a larger molecule. And when we do this, we're creating new covalent bonds. But there are specific names for each covalent bond depending on the type of molecule you're building. So we already learned that peptide bonds are covalent bonds that link amino acids together. If we are linking monosaccharides, we call those covalent bonds glycosidic linkages. If we're building a fat molecule, we call those new covalent bonds ester linkages. And if we're building a nucleic acid and linking nucleotides, we call those new covalent bonds phosphodiester linkages. It just depends on the molecule you're building. But these are all covalent bonds that we use to build our macromolecules. What are we looking at here? You should have guessed DNA again. Here's another illustration of DNA that has a bit more detail than our last one. Notice that DNA is in fact double-stranded. We've got two strands running in opposite directions. Therefore, they are anti-parallel. And we can see that more clearly here as we focus in on the deoxyribose sugars. Notice their orientation is flipped on the two strands so that the fifth carbon that's attached to a phosphate group on the left side is closest to that end of the molecule, whereas the third carbon that's attached to a hydroxyl group is closest to the top end on the complementary strand. How many base pairs are shown on this DNA molecule? There are four base pairs. Also notice that every DNA molecule has two strands with their own sugar phosphate backbone built from strong covalent bonds. Sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, backbone. And the other one has the same, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. Very strong backbone. And in the center of the molecule, we have hydrogen bonds between our complementary bases. Here are a few learning objectives for this chapter. Please remember that you have a more detailed list of objectives that I provide for you in the form of a Word document.